Welcome back to State of Belief Radio. I'm Welton Gaddy. When the next president of the United States is inaugurated on January 20th, a who's who of political conservative Christianity will be at his side. How much of that is connected with the next vice president, a self-described evangelical Catholic? And how much does it tell us about the role organized religion is likely to play in a Trump administration? Here with some insights is Rabbi Jack Moline, president of Interfaith Alliance. Jack, Happy New Year, and welcome back to State of Belief Radio. Thanks, Welton. I'm always glad to be here. So what was your first reaction to the announced list of religious leaders for the inauguration? My first reaction, uh, frankly, uh, and speaking of frankly, was that seeing Franklin Graham on that list did not uh, give me confidence in the inclusiveness of the upcoming administration. I was distressed that uh, they all seemed to be, all of the uh, religious speakers seemed to be of a particular uh, narrow swath of American Christianity, with the exception of Rabbi Heyer from the Simon Wiesenthal Center, and that in and of itself was a surprise. Mm-hmm. The um, I saw a piece, and I can't remember, I think it was in the Washington Post, on um, why evangelicals ought to be disturbed by uh, the people that have been selected to be at the uh, leaders in the inauguration. Um, it, it seems to me, Jack, that you go down that list and you picked uh, Franklin Graham. I certainly would have picked him, too, right off. But it's almost as if, with the exception you just mentioned, every one of those people poses real problems uh, because they never have shown much realization that there is um, a church-state separation in a country with religious freedom. So I, I think that's correct. It is, it's a troubling uh a troubling lineup. Um, I do note that Rick Warren uh, spoke at President Obama's inauguration uh, in 2012, and he did an admirable job of being inclusive. But Rick Warren was one of any number of people who participated in the inaugural events. I, I myself was invited to be a part of the prayer service before the public inauguration, which was also a multivalenced uh, opportunity for reflection and blessing. Uh, but I'm getting the impression that the nominees and the invitees and the uh, and the people that have surrounded our president-elect uh, have been sort of the answers to the question, who do I know, rather than who's the right person and, and uh, what will add credence and credibility to this endeavor that we're, we're in together to reimagine the country. That's very distressing to me. What message do the president-elect's choices for this res- these responsibilities, what message does this send to Americans who are not members of chosen religions? It certainly sends a message to me as a Jew that uh, there's much room for me on that platform, or that if there is room for me, it is only in that very narrow uh, strip of American Judaism that is that is orthodox. Um, I think that uh, people who are mainline Protestants, I think Roman Catholics, I think that certainly anybody who is part of the many minority faiths, and people who affirm no faith at all, who either claim to be agnostic or atheist, are going to find themselves unrepresented at this seminal moment, this pivotal moment in, in American society. And it is particularly distressing, Welton, because we have spent the last eight years not without struggle, making great advances in the area of inclusiveness and pluralism in this country. Interfaith Alliance has has both been in the forefront of those struggles and has celebrated uh, those accomplishments. And now we are we're looking from the very first moment of the Trump presidency at an attempt to turn the clock back to a time when, as we all know, everyone in America was an evangelical Protestant. Mm-hmm. Are there minority faith groups that have been speaking out about this? 
oh, I don't know a minority faith group that hasn't been speaking out about this, including the minorities within uh, the evangelical Christian community uh, who are distressed that many of the values that they uphold as, as being appropriate for a righteous life uh, seem to be uh, fuzzy or, or less uh, among some of the uh, members of the incoming administration. So we, we have heard from, from, uh, from Jews, from Muslims, from Sikhs, from Hindus, and, and especially from the uh, community of, of uh, secularists that they're very distressed as to, as to what seems to be ahead. So, uh, for a moment, let's just assume the worst. Favored religious groups will get preferential treatment, and that treatment is likely uh, to go way beyond what is constitutionally acceptable. Uh, What would the role of Interfaith Alliance be in that kind of scenario? So I want to speak very, very small first, and then I I will speak more philosophically, more, more largely. Um, we have, you and I, Welton, a, a dear friend named Maggie Siddiqui, who works for, right now, the Al-Hibri Foundation. She is an American Muslim, born and raised here, uh, uh, covers her hair. She's very devout. She's also very progressive and has worked very hard at our coalitions. When uh, the talk of a Muslim registry and the talk of excluding uh, immigrants from countries that are majority Muslim or Arab was a foot in the campaign. She really had sort of a public panic, and she posted uh, something about it on Facebook. I immediately picked up the phone and called her, and I reassured her. I said, Maggie, you have nothing to worry about. I will stand with you no matter what. And the people in my community, both the Jewish community and the interfaith community, will stand with you no matter what. Don't be afraid. We're all going to stand together. She was very appreciative of that phone call, I have to tell you. And she, in fact, recorded it off of her telephone so she could post it on Facebook as the response to her her small panic attack. Hmm. A few weeks later, there was a, a report that I'm sure most of our listeners uh, saw of the gathering of white supremacists in Washington, D.C., where Richard Spencer was, uh, was busy uh, doing his best imitation of national socialism in Weimar, Germany. And um, seeing the the salutes that were being uh, offered to him and the cries of hail Trump and, and things like that. And um, Maggie's Facebook posting that day was to her Jewish friends. And it said, I don't want you to worry about anything. I'm going to stand with you no matter what. Uh, and the people around me and the people in the organizations I'm involved with will stand with you also. That kind of person to person and, and direct uh, support, mutual support, among the communities that feel threatened is extraordinarily important. And it was something I was able to do because of the position I hold. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of outreach that we at Interfaith Alliance are going to encourage between neighbor and neighbor. That is something that anybody listening to this program can do, is to make sure that their neighbors know that no matter what their their religious perspective, no matter what their philosophy, that their neighbors are going to stand with them in support of their constitutional rights. As an organization, I have to say that that you left me a great legacy, Welton. Unfortunately, we fought a lot of these battles already uh, four years ago, 12 years ago, 20 years ago. And uh, we will continue to lobby our legislators. We will continue to join coalition on legislation and to file amicus briefs on on court cases that secure the hard won hard won rights of of Americans of minority status and frankly majority status as well. Uh, there there is not a mass conspiracy against uh, against uh, Protestants in this country, but there are times when we in the interfaith community need to stand up for our Christian brothers and sisters who otherwise enjoy certain privilege. Jack, in the first weeks after the election, we broadcast some interviews asking uh, some of our favorite regular guests what their mindset was. Uh, Not surprisingly, there was a lot of worry and concern with faith leaders in particular sharing the fears they were hearing from congregants. And then we got some complaints with 
people saying we shouldn't be stressing the negative, but uh, it would be beyond inauthentic to predetermine the tone of our interviews. Now that some weeks have passed, what are you hearing from members and supporters of Interfaith Alliance? Has the tone shifted at all? Uh, the tone of concern, if anything, has gotten deeper uh, as people have seen the uh, nominees to the various positions of authority in the Trump administration. And I want to emphasize that's concern. There are some people who are attempting to organize a, a revolution against thin air right now. Uh, I'm not one of those people who thinks we should wait and see what's going to happen. We have to be prepared. But I'm also not one of those people who is ready to, to issue a, a symbolic call to arms because we've heard some unpleasant things from, from the incoming president. Um, I will tell you a great story, Welton, that, that I'm not telling out of school because it will also be on social media today. I'm fortunate to have a, a friendship with uh, Senator Tim Kaine and saw him for the first time after the election uh, just the other day. Uh, we were in a group of people having a conversation about his experiences. And uh, he was asked what gave him hope. And he said when he got to his office, his staff showed him a picture that was posted on Facebook by a little girl in Richmond, which is his hometown. And uh, it came with a letter that said she was concerned because she had any number of children in her class who were the children of immigrants, and she was worried that they were going to be deported. And she said, you have to be uh, the hero that will protect them. And she drew a picture, and the picture was of him, including his, his uh, pin that he wears on his lapel to indicate he's a United States senator. And flowing from his back was a cape with a T on it. And mm -hmm. she wrote to him, be the hero. Mm -hmm. And Senator Kane was just so touched and tickled by that. And, and by today, when we're speaking, has posted on his Facebook an appreciation of that picture and a, and, and an, a challenge to everyone who reads it, which is we can all hashtag be the hero. And I think that is, is more a sense of what I'm getting from people, is that they are ready for the challenge of what's ahead. There is no turning back the clock to a different election outcome. It seems to be the will of at least the Electoral College. But moving forward, we can't simply wring our hands and, and furrow our brows and condemn what hasn't happened yet. We have to be prepared to defend our values and our, our commitments. Oh, that's a great story and inspiring. Um, I, I want to look up the street from you in Washington for a moment. Uh, you spectacularly work with a lot of leaders on Capitol Hill. Without naming names, can you talk about the tone you're hearing from the lawmakers with whom uh, you're talking right now? Sure. I, I will say that right after the election, uh, the people that I have a relationship with were, were stunned and depressed. Um, and I will, I will say that, um, again, without naming names, they're not all Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, they, were, uh, they were distressed because they objected before the election to the tone of, uh, of the campaign, and particularly from Mr. Trump. But what I have heard post-election mm -hmm. is the same kind of determination that was expressed by Senator Kane, um, that uh, everybody now, those who support the president-elect and those who are concerned about the president-elect, everybody now believes that there is a shift coming in American society and that it is up to each of us to work as hard as we possibly can to make sure that the America ahead is better than the America that was behind. And I will leave it to individual listeners as to whether that means America will be yet greater or America will be great again. But uh, everybody believes that America is great. We're just about out of time, but I want to ask you two questions that I think uh, merge with one another. Um, as we start this new year, what should listeners be keeping in mind and 
along with that question, what are the priorities or what is the priority of Interfaith Alliance right now? Great. So the first thing that uh, listeners should keep in mind is is not to give up. Never give up, never give in. Uh, that the support that they have shown for State of Belief Radio, that the support that they've shown for Interfaith Alliance continue to be critical elements in the public discourse around protecting freedom of conscience and protecting the independence of government from, from religious influence and from influencing religion. So uh, that is the mindset I urge people to cultivate. You, you want to be unhappy, you want to be depressed, or you want to be elated. That's all well and good. The hard work is ahead of us, and we shouldn't give up. Interfaith Alliance, I will say, is examining its priorities now. We really believed, and I don't apologize for this, that we would be looking at sanding some rough edges. And now it seems to me that we're going to be looking at the kind of agenda that we had in in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, when we could not be assured that some of the rights and privileges that we had been fighting for would be secured. We made great strides. Uh, over the past eight years, and we're going to have to work hard to protect them. Rabbi Jack Moline is president of Interfaith Alliance, protecting true religious freedom for every American. Among its other important work, the Alliance has been the sponsor of this show since its inception. Uh, Jack, it's, uh, I don't have to tell you, it's going to be a challenging year. We'll keep listeners up to date on the work of Interfaith Alliance and ways for them uh, to join in that work. For that reason and others, we want you uh, more prominent on this show and talking about uh, things that you want to be talking about that are important uh, related to what's going on in our nation. Today, thanks for taking time to be with us again on State of Belief Radio. It's always a pleasure to be with you.